what is going on you guys i can't speak this this is minimal i need to speak so loud because it's raining outside all right i guess it's time for another q a vlog this time and i just did it last minute so i just quickly ran to get to this event and this is a pretty exciting one i think it's a i've been waiting for this for a while as well God, it's really cold <laughs> all right coming up next my vlog by the way, I'm currently in Pasadena, California, right here in downtown. This is where I previously did my my Lightbox Expo vlog, right here. Around this beautiful downtown area of Pasadena. Ah, oh, man. Sorry to hear some, some noises because it's raining in part two. The Torre Arbella. But anyways, yeah, I'm, I'm back here in Pasadena. Pretty excited for this, for this day as well. I mean, I'm pretty excited for every vlog though. Okay, so I'll be finding my directions to get there and all right, we'll just get it started. Squirrel! Look at the squirrel! He just left. I wonder where he went. Oh, I see him. He just popped out of the tree. And he went back in. And he's leaving. I love squirrels. All right, I found it. Right here at the Lee Edward Travis Arboretum. Oh, I'm excited for this, and we'll just get on with the vlog. They're just getting ready. I'm just here waiting. Oh, by the way, Fuller is actually a private Christian college, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> I'm not Christian, but it's interesting to, to know that they have one here in Pasadena. Look, you can see the cross over in the middle. Can you see it? It's right there. All right, they just opened the doors and here you go. So I'll take in the front. Yep, this is the closest I can get to reach the few doctors I get. All right. And, uh, my, my name is Peter Calloway. I'm God, it's P doctor, you guys. Um, along with a few other people. And we'll talk to them a little bit about why we chose this film in particular for us to watch. Um, it happens to be that we are on uh, Oscar weekends uh, on Sunday. Uh, Pixar also has some uh, films that are up for some Oscars, so we can all do some like good vibes towards the Oscars. Although, does that happen in retrospect? So everyone's already voted, right? So does it work? I don't know. We can, we can do, uh, you know, retrospective good vibes. Um, but we're super delighted to have you here. Um, really honored to uh, screen Soul for you tonight. And uh, incredibly delighted to uh, have the doctor uh, come and give up his time um, and his wisdom in terms of uh, creation, uh, in terms of animation, in terms of storytelling. Uh, so stick around. We are going to talk to him after we screen Soul. Um, I think that's everything I need to know. Um, if you know or don't know where the bathrooms are, they're out there. Um, there's a code you'll see on the front door um, if you need to go. But otherwise, um, without further ado, Soul. Uh, Turning Red was up this year. 
Um, when I reached out to you and said, hey, what if we did kind of like an Oscar sting, something or other with you? Um, and you pick any of your, any of the films you want us to screen. And you said, let's go with Soul. Why Soul? Well, uh, first of all, this is actually the first time I've seen this movie with an audience. Oh. Uh, so, thank you. during COVID from our houses and it came out and went right to Disney Plus. So I never got to see it with a crowd. This was a great crowd to see it with. <laughs> yeah, they were, uh, they were at every beat. I was like, man, if you're riding for like different uh, emotional high points, you all <laughs> reacted well. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> to me, the biggest laugh in the film is when it says, after Joe falls to the manhole, it goes to Walt Disney Presents. <laughs> I can't quite believe that we made this movie under the Disney name. I mean, it's crazy. Oh, that's pretty great. Um, so, was there anything? So you go, you spend so much time with a movie like this, and you're anticipating what a real life audience would, would notice or you know feel. So I'm sure it's it's great to feel like, oh, that worked. Was there anything that was surprising? You're like, oh, I didn't I didn't anticipate that kind of emotional uh, import or something else as you were watching it with the live. Well, yeah, I mean, the fact that people track things that is, are as bizarre as they are uh, was, was uh, fascinating. And um, I mean, I don't know whether this landed for everybody, but um, the whole, what I would call the emotional punchline of the film, where Joe finally gets to do what he's been dreaming of his whole life and it doesn't fulfill him. Uh, I remember we were working on that scene at the studio and one of the animators came up to me and said, that's wrong. That scene is wrong. If he's been dreaming of this thing his whole life, he would be on a level the whole, like for months. And I'm like, how old are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm 32. <laughs> okay, just wait a couple years. <laughs> and I don't know if that's true for everybody, but I, I do feel like the, the, the impetus behind this film was for me having the amazing chance to work on Inside Out. And that film hit on so many different levels, I, I can't take credit for it, um, that it, it, you know, audience response, we got critical response, it was one of the top films, of original films that Pixar ever did, and I thought, great, now what? What do I do now? Do I just, I guess I go back to work? It didn't change me in the way that I thought it would. I know, I know that's totally irrational, we all know better than that, but on some level, I did feel like somehow my accomplishments would get me to a place where I feel like, okay, I, I've earned, yeah. I don't know what. <laughs> and so that was really the impetus behind this film. Biography here, um, and I want to get to jazz in a second, but um, it sounds like what you're saying is it's kind of like this infinitely receding horizon. Like I'm, I'm after this thing that's unachievable, really, and, but I've convinced myself it's success, it's my spark, it's my purpose, whatever, and if I can achieve that, some kind of fulfillment, something will happen, and yet it's inherently unfulfilling once you get there. Um, it, that's what you're exploring then, uh, in this movie at its core. Yeah, and I think, well, I don't know, I can't speak for everybody in the room, but I think a lot of people do have this idea, in whatever way, that they can earn their way into acceptance, love, God's grace, whatever that is, um, and yet you don't have to, you know, and that's the weird gift that we can't fully really explain, that we don't deserve, and yet is there, um, and that's, I don't know what more to say. Huh. Um, well, then let's take it uh, from a sideways uh, yeah. way and talk about jazz instead. Yeah. Um, I've, I've read that you have said, this film started as a love letter to jazz, but we had no idea how much jazz would teach us about life. So first, why did you want to write a love letter to jazz? And then what was it that it taught you about life? Well, backing up, okay, so as I said, uh, this film was kind of autobiographical, and so being an animator, I thought, well, I can't just have the guy an animator, that would be weird <laughs> in an animated film especially. <laughs> so maybe he could be an actor. So we, the first draft of this, Joe was, he was actually a, a white uh, middle-aged guy who was starring in Death of a Salesman, which we thought was right. <laughs> <laughs> but what we found was that everyone 
who watched the film said, oh, he wants to be famous, that's what's driving him. And that was not what I was going for. We wanted everyone to root for this character. He's after something noble. He wants the purity of that passion. And we thought, well, what better than a jazz music? You don't go into jazz to get rich and famous, right? <laughs> you go there because you love it. You have a passion for it. And once we hit on jazz, there were a couple things that that resonated. First of all, jazz has one of the first associations with animation. As soon as there was sound, jazz and animation were connected. So that was right away we knew something. I loved jazz growing up. Um, uh, it has a big connection. And I played jazz. So I played the stand-up bass. Uh, I say play charitably, but anyway. Um, and then as we got into it, we said, okay, well, jazz. One of our consultants said it's a. Uh, uh, well, it is the great gift of African-American uh, people who, one of the many. Uh, and so we thought, well, Joe should be African-American. And then I realized I'm in big trouble because I don't know at all about this and we need help. And so Kent Powers, who came on first as a writer and then co-director, kind of was the first step. It was a group lift. We had a lot of great consultants, people at the studio. We can talk more about that if you'd like. but. Um, you know, really exploring what all that means to be an African uh, an African American male in the jazz community in Manhattan. Those are all very specific things that we wanted to get right. Yeah. Well, it reminds me. Um, we were at dinner, so we were talking about kids, and uh, my kids, and, and actually, this is generational, both in the UK and the US. Um, I think it was like 20 years ago. Uh, the average high schooler, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's doctor, lawyer, astronaut. Whatever. Um, and now, uh, number one is celebrity. Um, and, and when I follow up and say, well, for what? It doesn't matter. Um, most of the time it's like YouTube star or something like that. It's like, well, for a talent? No, just I want to be celebrated. So this is, it's interesting because you're, you're, you're kind of leveraging that, that desire to achieve, to do something, but rooting it in a very particular um, uh, uh, condition. So. Uh, I am in New York playing the jazz scene, you know, an African American musician right there. Um, and it's interesting because that, I think, requires a kind of collaborativity that you, were, you mentioned. Because when you get down to the particular, uh, none of us quite have everything we need to tell that story. So maybe say a little bit about your kind of, I guess it's philosophy of collaboration. Um, because you have a pretty strong uh, say in how these, these stories come about. Um, what does it mean then to say, I'm going to bring in other people? Um, how do they shape the story on a fundamental level? How do you work with them? What, what does that look like? Once in a while, people will ask me to come in as some sort of advisor to the stories in the halls. Like, you're in big trouble because I don't know what the heck I'm doing. Uh, and I mean that genuinely. I think it's essential that you start out from a place of vulnerability and unknowing. Because if you start out with an agenda, you're going to lecture people. The movie needs to find itself, and this film is a, as all the films I've done are, are were that, right? I started with an idea, but then it is a process of surrendering yourself to both the process and um, the amazing talents that, uh, that you get to work with. And everyone that uh, contributed to this film brought something of themselves, and that's what I try to foster as a director is, is not I think a lot of people think of like, you know, the director is the guy with the megaphone, all right, bring in the double or whatever it is. <laughs> and um, what I'm really trying to do is bring enough specificity so that people know what's required, but leave enough open-ended so that they can bring something of themselves instead of me saying, that should be red, 4.3 feet tall, whatever. You know, I, I, I want them to bring their own specificity to, because really at the root of it, you think, okay, what are movies for? Why do we watch movies? I think it's to feel something. We want to have a connection to something that's bigger than us. And that's what we're trying to do as we make it as well. Um, which is a little bit like jazz, right? Like, um, I'm, I, I'm terrible at jazz, but I love it. Yeah. Um, and I think if, you know, <laughs> some of the like uh, silly things people say about jazz, like, why don't they just play the right notes? Right? Um, um, okay, that's a jazz joke. Um, but, but one of the things is uh, improvisational jazz in particular um, appears to, to those who are uninitiated or may not be musicians themselves as if they kind of just showed up five minutes before, you know, you know, warmed up, 
and now they're they're improving and it just happens. When in fact the musicians are profoundly experienced, um, like usually some of the most brilliant musical minds I've ever met, um, deeply rooted in a tradition of music, um, their technical skills are off the charts. But there's something about that that is required to then get to the point where it's now it's the performance. And they're there and they're riffing off of each other in a way that none of them actually anticipated or expected. But it requires that kind of like give and take, the humility, and at the same time, a really great technical skill and proficiency. So is that what you're looking for in collaborators? Are you going like, I need you not just to be humble, but actually excellent. Like I need you to be the best as you come onto the stage now we're kind of collaborating. How do you how do you think about that when you're bringing on a collaborator? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great analogy because as I'm working with a DP or a character designer or an animator, I'm expecting, like, there's no way I can play piano like John Batiste. But when I get to speak with John, and that was really one of the great joys of working on this film, was getting to know John. He's an amazing human and an incredible player, obviously. Um, he affected so much of the movie. But yeah, he, he and everybody, is able to bring up the level in ways that I would never be able to do, or any of the rest of us. So yeah, it's, it's absolutely right. So say that, um, that Soul was a little bit unique in, the, in, the, in that sort of give and take between sort of final film, the final cut, and then how music came in. Um, and John Batiste being one of those, um, Alex Ross, Trent Reznor, um, for the first time, right, you worked with that, that yeah. group. Um, uh, what, as you think about that and how you made Soul, um, what do you think would have been different about the movie if it weren't for like that particular group of musicians you worked with? Well, um, I mean, first of all, knowing, we knew that, uh, okay, so usually the way animation works is you record all the actors, you build all the sets and characters, you animate, and then you finish the film, and then uh, the musician comes along, someone like Randy Newman or Michael Giacchino, writes the score, uh, and then we do final mix. In this case, we knew that we were going to have the music so central, there was no way we would be able to post sync it. So we recorded all the jazz elements before the animation. And in the same way that animators listen to a vocal performance from uh, an actor, they listened over and over to the, the musical performance. We also set up, I don't know, like 50 cameras all around every musician so that the animators could really get not only hitting the right notes, but like the phrasing, the, the fluidity of the uh, performance, and they, they did an amazing job. So we recorded all the jazz stuff earlier. Trent Maticus um, worked in very different ways than, uh, than Randy or, or, or Michael, and um, they gave us a lot of options. They would give us, they, like the end scene, the scene that, that kills me is what we call the epiphany, where Joe plays his life, he puts, takes the music away and puts all these pieces of junk on the piano and plays his life. And they gave us, I think, seven different cues that for, for us to choose from. And uh, I chose this one and I was, I couldn't help but think, is this a test? You know, are they, are they testing me? And I think they, they were basically just giving us options to see how, because uh, I think all of them, that's just the way they worked. Anyway, it was, it was a great process, it was really interesting. Well, I just got off in the Q&A from P Doctors Inside, I mean, Inside Inside Iowa. He signed my inside out pop figure, it's so cool. So, no, for his for his recent film, Soul. And, you know, I really want to talk about Soul in my channel. I'm going to do it right now. It's definitely one of Pixar's best. It's Pixar's best, no matter what. It's it's obviously going to be really well done. I mean, it's Pete Doctor, man. He directed one of my favorites, Monsters, Inc. Carl Fragerson, the movie. Joy, the movie. You know, all these classics. I'm gonna head home right now, you guys. So, yeah, it's so great to finally meet the man. He's actually one of my inspirations and reasons why I want to work in the animation. All right, you guys, I'll be it for now. I make this a quick vlog on, on this one because next month, actually, I'm pretty excited. If you guys see my vote, you see these two Mirabel pop figures I, I just posted. Well, we got a winner, and I'm gonna stick with the original Mirabel pop figure. So, Stephanie Beatrice is gonna sign it for me. I actually got reservations to meet her in a couple of weeks, so I'm pretty excited for that one. As of now, P Doctor already signed my Joy Pop figure, so putting that on my history books, I will say. Well, I gotta say, Soul is a classic, it's a masterpiece. It's Pixar's best, in my opinion.
one of their best. I mean, there's Toy Story. Can't forget about that. All right, I'll be out of here, you guys. Take care, okay? Remember to like, comment, subscribe, and all that. And don't forget to check out my Patreon as well. So for with that, you get some extra shout outs. There's a shout out to, to my anonymous post as well. My anonymous user, sorry. So yeah, thanks again, you guys. I'll see you guys next time. Chill.